It's fun watching people work so hard, gathering all of the evidence, then not being able to name me or catch me. You see, I always win. I always hold the trump card. I will continue to make more movies. The next time you hear from me, it will be in a movie that I am producing that will have some humans in it and not just pussies. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. <laughs> Are you well? Are you good? I am. So, it's going to kick off with talking about the lovely, brilliant, and <laughs> crazy reaction to the John List episode that I put up midweek. Yep, so much hatred for John List. So much passion in what people had to say so a couple of you who made the more <laughs> brilliantly articulate responses you'll be getting mentioned in the shout outs so let's get straight to them and then we'll get on with the story okay so shout out to Ian Spencer who said <laughs> of John List this guy needed shafting with the sharp end of a revolving pineapple <laughs> I love that I mean it's a terrible image it's a terrible image to bring to mind but you know <laughs> thanks Ian <laughs> and Sandra Kelly who said I would piss on his grave. Lovely. Thank you, Sandra. And to Rebecca Kiernan, who said he was a shit stain of a human. Yes, all very true. Hmm. Thank you. Other shout outs go to Libby Walton Bryant, who got in touch and asked me a great question, which was, is there something, is there a story that you would never touch? And I replied and said, yes. And that would definitely be the Casey Anthony story. I just can't do the Casey Anthony story. I can't do it. She knew that our child was dead for a month. And she did nothing about it. I can't deal with it. It's too much. So... Also, hello to, right, got my work cut out of me here, Coralie Sifton, who said to me, good luck with my name, but you know what, I think I've got it sorted, I think actually that's how it reads, but actually it's Coralie Shiftishik, does that sound good? I think that's what it is, and the final one goes to Senga, who you'll know um, if you're on the Facebook group, is an admin of the group. She's currently in China. It's her birthday. She deserves a birthday song. 
now. I've used up all my good party songs. I've used up Stevie Wonder and the classic. So I'll go for a bit of um, <laughs> I'll go for a bit of Marilyn Monroe. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Right, I think that's enough of Happy Birthday to You by Marilyn Monroe because that was. It was actually quite painful for me to even hear in my own ears, never mind anyone else's. And finally, thank you to those who are listening to the Patreon episodes and getting in touch about those. Lovely to have you on Patreon and listening to those stories. All right, let's get on with this week's story. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. So we are in 1982 and Eric Newman comes in to the world. Right, he's born in East Toronto and he's born and he grows up with his two parents but at a young age his parents they split up now immediately there's a problem here because Eric wants a lot of attention from both parents but now that they're split up he has to vie for their attention so he doesn't live with either of his parents instead he lives with his gran and his grandfather And he's homeschooled by them. His gran (laughs) would tell him at a young age, the world is a dirty, dirty place. She's not wrong. (laughs) Now, homeschooling. Homeschooling is something I've always got a question mark over. I think it's one of those things I need to think through for myself slightly more. Maybe I just need to understand it a little bit better. I can see on the surface all the benefits of it. I just wonder, is it slightly isolating? But I don't know. Now, if if you have ever been homeschooled, please let me know. Please challenge me and tell me what it's actually like. So with his parents split, he's living with his grandparents, but they also split up. Eric is in a place where he needs more attention from everyone. This is all becoming really fragmented and it's really not great for him. So as a young child, what was what was Eric like? Well, he was vain. He was very, very vain. He had a very high opinion of himself. He thought of himself from a young age as beautiful. And that was how he described himself. So there comes a point in his teenage years where his grandparents have split, his mum and dad have split. He'd been living with his gran for a long time But he moves back in with his mum. And he goes to high school, which must be so weird after you've been homeschooled. It must be so odd. If you've never, if you've always been homeschooled and suddenly you're in a school of, I don't know, hundreds of people, you must just be like, what the fuck is this? What is going on? Anyway, he goes to school. So Eric, or beautiful Eric, (laughs) as he thinks of himself, he tells his family when he's about 15 years old that he thinks he's struggling with depression. So good, good. I I would advocate that any person who's ever struggling with depression or 
any kind of problem in their life, talk about it, deal with it, get it out there. The more time you spend not saying it, the worse it gets. Just, you know, get it out there. So at age 16, a year after talking about his depression, he's given medication for his depression to help him cope. And now I have slight problems with this because the diagnosis is, yes, he's depressed. And yes, he's showing signs that he might have some behaviours that need to be managed. So sometimes he can get really angry. Sometimes he can go almost manic. And what doctors do is they say at this point, okay, we're going to put you on a medication for life. Now, I don't think that any doctor undertakes that decision lightly. No, of course they don't. But also, at at a teenage age, to be told, you are now on this medication for life, immediately sends a warning signal. That immediately says, this is someone who actually needs to be monitored quite closely. Because if you're already saying at a teenage age, you're on this for life, then let's see what the future is going to hold for that person. They need to be monitored. I know two people in my life who were given the diagnosis of depression at roughly 17, 18 years old. And the problem is, they're actually people who are now out doing great things. They've got families, they've got jobs, but they use their depression as a way to define them. And that's because they were given that diagnosis at a young age. And there was never a kind of conversation about, which there always has to be a conversation about going, let's try something short term and we'll just see if we can move your life on in other ways or we'll see if you can through some therapy, through whatever, we can get you out of having to constantly be on medication. But it just seemed for Eric, there was no way other than here are your drugs, you're on these for life. So Eric, the self-proclaimed beautiful one, he leaves school. And, well, he doesn't really launch himself into any particular direction or have a focus. The one thing that drives Eric forward all the time is, all through his depression, his self-belief. He believes in himself. He believes himself to be the beautiful one. Now, you, at this point, may be feeling a little ambivalent about Eric at this point in the story, that is fair enough. That's kind of how I felt. But we're now going to wander down the path of what Eric did next. And I think you'll certainly have some strong feelings. Eric spends a lot of time online. An unhealthy amount of time online and a lot of his time is spent in chat rooms and groups that he finds on Facebook and groups that he finds through different websites that he's going to all the time through one of the groups that he's in he meets a woman who is 18 years old now She has learning difficulties. And in everything that I read and in everything that I researched, it said that she was 18 years old, but that in terms of functioning in the world, her understanding of things was probably around the level of about 12 years old. 
they form a they form a nice relationship online. I say nice relationship, of course not nice coming from this guy's point of view. But they form a relationship and they meet. They take selfies together. They go out for drinks, but it's all paid by her. Eric manages to convince her to give him her credit card details. Hmm. Now when he's got her credit card details, he goes a-spending. He goes crazy. He racks up some amount of debt. Now eventually someone in her family realises, okay, this is not right. This credit card has spiralled out of control. What the fuck is happening? And Eric is caught. And charged. Good. Good. What's not so good is that what comes along with this is a sexual assault charge. So the woman, that 18 year old with learning difficulties, comes forward and says, he sexually assaulted me. Okay, so he's going to go to court and he's going to face the charges of sexual assault and fraud. Doesn't look good. Does not look good for Eric. Days before the court case arrives, the sexual assault charges are dropped. Mysteriously dropped. I cannot find the reason why they were dropped. And believe me, I've tried. But, gone. I've watched interviews with the man who was representing Eric in court. And I cannot find out how it came about. Those were dropped. So when it came to it, actually, what he was in court for was fraud. And so he's found guilty. And he goes to prison for that charge. And he spends a year and a half in prison. And then he is free. So now we move to 2006. He is 22 years old. He's been through major family breakups. He's lived here, there. Everywhere around Canada. And from this point on, we will no longer know Eric as Eric. Because Eric Newman is about to legally change his name to Luca Magnotta. And that's a name that might be familiar to some. So, Eric is no longer Eric. He's now Luca Magnotta. Interesting, interesting name choice there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, new name. And what this new name brings about for him is it brings about a new online presence. He decides he's going to start setting himself up online as Luca Magnotta. And he's going to be something big online. What is Luca trying to achieve? What's his, like, what's his objective in life? Well, it's very simply to be someone. To be noticed. To be famous. This guy wants to go down in history. He wants people to know the name Luca Magnotta. Now, you can, I suppose, you can stop, you can question that, and you can say, what is that desire for that? Is it broken families at a young age, or... Is it, you know, his depression, his struggle? Is it that? Or is it actually that he's just 
one of these people who needs validation, who just needs validation. Well, he might need validation, but what he also needs is some serious psychiatric help as we are about to learn. So now he is online and he makes he makes a physical move from the east of Toronto to the gay part of Toronto. And this is where he is about to try and launch himself as a star. He wants to be a man to know. His drive is that the name Luca Magnata would be known worldwide. He's decided this. He's made this a choice. So... (laughs) What he does here is he launches himself as a model. Hmm. Now, when you see images of him, like, I can see a sort of category that he might fit into, but he ain't no, you know, he's no bloody Brad Pitt. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Brad Pitt's such a shit option to use. But he's no... You know, he's nothing spectacular. He does kind of just look like your average guy on the street. But he, in his head, thinks that he is, you know, the next fucking incredible model in the world. He starts to advertise himself online as a high-class male escort. I mean, come on. We could all do that. We could all do fucking do that. That's easy. What he does is he signs up to a few different places. Like he's, he's he's just looking at this moment for where can I get famous? Where can I where can I make some? Where can I make a name for myself in the world? And he signs himself up to a couple of gay porn companies. Now they're n- nothing major. They're fairly low budget, kind of thing you know he's not signing with any big massive agencies because he's just he's just trying to punt himself and I'm sure these agencies are just like yeah yeah you're just another one coming through the door who thinks they're a model who thinks they're amazing or whatever although I will I will tell you this (laughs) My, my research for this episode has been in about three or four different parts. So I've watched a couple of documentaries, read a couple of things, done a few different bits here and there. And I had to do some of it on the move the other day. So I'm on the train to work and I'm watching some clips on YouTube about (laughs) Luca's journey. And I get to the point where it's gay porn. Did not realise the documentary was actually going to move into showing me the fucking gay porn. I'm on a crowded train, like going... Oh, 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 literally had a moment of panic where I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, oh, oh, the screen was like massive on my phone. I was going, I was like trying to hit the fuck, luckily I had my headphones in, but I was like hitting the button to try and get rid of it. I was like, what the fuck? I just, it just totally came out of the blue. I just didn't see it coming. <laughs> literally. And I mean, I have to tell you, my, um, my delicate eyes... They just, just didn't know how to cope with what I saw. <laughs> so now, the journey for Luca, in his mind, has really begun. He is absolutely on a path where he's like, I'm going to be famous. People are going to know who I am. Be that through modelling, gay porn, Be that whatever, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. He starts appearing in some, like, really, really terrible internet TV programs. They're all absolutely fucking the gubbins of the day. They're all fucking useless. And he starts to apply for lots of reality TV shows. Because, you know, that doesn't look desperate. He starts applying to, like, strange shows like... Yes, I want plastic surgery and all this sort of shit. And 
Yeah, sometimes what happens is he, he applies these things and he gets invited along for an audition. But he always gets bumped at the end of the day. They always go, no. I think it's interesting that he went for so many of these reality TV shows trying to get on to all of these things and every time the producers went hmm no now you know I don't really watch reality TV in fact I don't ever watch reality TV but you know fine well that the people who are on these programs want fame they're looking for something else but I just think it's interesting that there's something that even TV producers who are willing to exploit people to the absolute max got to a point with Luca where they went, oh God, no, no. Even though, I mean, he's out there. He's a really out there kind of guy. But there's something in them that just went, hmm, nah, too much. You know what I think that is? I genuinely, like, when I was sort of sitting back and thinking about it, I think it's that with these TV producers, and I could be way off the mark, and I don't know any of these people, so maybe I'm guessing. I think there's a point where they go, yeah, we want people who are a bit wild, a bit crazy, they're going to give us entertainment. But also I think they probably can detect something that's a little bit deeper and a little bit more troubling. And they probably think, we can't take that on. And I genuinely think that was the case here with Luca. I think it's why he was being knocked back. It's because they were looking at him and going, yeah, you say outrageous things, and yes, you're willing to strip all your clothes off and do all these things on TV, but there's a darker, darker element to you, and we don't really want to take that on. That's just my guess. But I think I might actually be right in that. So Luca is a bit frustrated that his fame isn't really taking off in the way that he had really wanted it. So now what he does next is just, oh, come on. It's so stupid. He basically attaches himself online to a well-known serial killer. He starts an internet rumour that he is the new boyfriend of Carla Homolka. Now, Carla Homolka, if you don't know, in brief, was part of a partnership with her partner, Paul Sutherland, in which they killed three teenagers. I cite Carla Homolka as one of the people that I will never talk about on this podcast. I will never tell her story. Her, Casey Anthony, get in the fire. Not interested. You killed kids. I am not fucking interested. But Carla Homolka was big news. And so... Luca pretends that he was her new boyfriend. He actually goes to the lengths. Now, he, he's never met her. He has never met this woman. She lives in a whole other place from him. But he does crazy things like he photoshops pictures of her with someone else and puts his own head on the picture. And then sends them out to the internet saying, Oh, look at Carla Homoka's new boyfriend. Luca Magnotta. This guy is... I mean, this is all happening inside his apartment in Toronto. This is it. It's just... It's all coming from, like, his apartment. It's just insane. It's all bollocks. It's all absolute bollocks. He was obsessed with serial killers. He was obsessed. And so he wanted to pretend that he was dating her. It would be like me saying, I I quite like 
serial killers, I'm shagging Ted Bundy. Now, I know that's obviously not possible. <laughs> Ted Bundy's dead. And also, <laughs> would you ever want to shag Ted Bundy? Uh, no thanks. But it is the equivalent of just being like, no, that is nuts. Like, what are you talking about? This guy is a grade A nut job. I mean, he really is, and I hate to say that because, yes, maybe he has depression, but also it doesn't excuse the behaviour that he's displaying. He's so, he's so entranced in this world of b- trying to create the the thing that is going to be Luca Magnotta online that he just is going to crazy lengths to try and do it. So the whole uh, I'm Luca Magnotta, Carla Hamoka, serial killer business. It dies down very quickly. There's not really much uptake from it. And this annoys him. This annoys him because he wants the attention. He's livid that actually he's not getting the fucking notoriety that he thinks he deserves. So if we just look at him now, right? He's tried gay porn and being a model. That didn't really fare very well. He's tried being a reality TV star. That also... It didn't really bring much. He's then tried to say, I'm dating a serial killer. That also didn't really work. So by now, he's like frantically wanting to be bigger and better and just be known. He wants his name out there. (sighs) And how he goes about that next is just horrible. In 2010, he posts on his Facebook page a video titled Three Men and One Hammer. And in this video, you can, I've not watched it, but you can see a man being beaten to death by three teenagers with a hammer. Now, was Luca one of these men beating someone to death with a hammer? Well, we'll figure that out later. The video gets an incredible response online. Of course it does. Of course it does. It's one of these things that, you know, it... People want want to see this. There's, I mean, there's all these weird sites, isn't there? Like, the... I don't know what they're called. Like, the gory blood gore or, like, where you can go and you can watch horrific... I think it's all a bit dark web shit. Nothing that I would ever, really ever, ever want to go and watch. But Luca is playing into that world. He is playing into that. He's going... I'm going to put up some really shocking stuff. I'm going to put up a video of a man being killed with a hammer. So he loves the response. He is really into the response. And the next videos that he posts, because he loves that attention, I'm just going to warn you now, description of them is horrible and if in particular you are a cat lover you're gonna find these hard you i'm just warning you now okay the first video that he puts up is called one bag two kittens What happens in this video is that he puts two kittens into a vacuum sealed bag and he sucks the oxygen out of it. Both kittens die. 
And this is... What? An attempt. It's a fucking attempt by him to gain some sort of presence in the online world. He just wants to be noticed. Dick. Fucking dick. But if he wanted attention, well, he got it. He really fucking got it because you you can't put up a cat. You can't put that up. You can't what? You can't put up a video of two kittens dying and not expect that there's going to be a huge reaction. And that's what he wanted. He wanted that reaction. I think what he didn't expect was that actually there was going to be such an outrage from people that actually what they decided to do was create a task force to find him. So many people were so outraged by the video of the kittens dying that they created a group which started with, I think, maybe 50, 60 people who were like, we are going to find this man who did this. We're going to find the guy who did this to kittens. Of course, you know, he's loving that. He's like, great, this is just all the better for me. Because all I want is to be a fucking celebrity. All I want is to be known. I want my name out there. (sighs) So a group has formed. They've formed a little task force. And they're going to try and hunt him down. What did he do? in response to there being people who were so outraged. Well, he posted more videos of kittens being killed. He is loving this attention. So in response to a lot of the conversation that's going around, who is the man that's killing the kittens? He, under another (laughs) alias, another name, goes online and says, the man you're looking for is called Luca Magnota. He lives in Hollywood. Not true, because he's living in Canada. But he's loving this. He's loving the lies. So now, of course, the name Luca Magnota, it's being searched frequently. But this is what he wants. He joins in the online discussion, right? Around him, the kitten killer, as he's being known. He joins in these discussions under different names, under different profiles. And at one point he calls... As, as someone else, he calls himself the King of Canada. The King of... I mean, you fucking kidding me on. This guy is... Oh, what is this guy? What the fuck's going on? But the profiles are insane. So he creates, like, sort of maybe between about 15 and 20 different profiles for himself. So he's always operating on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram on all these things, as someone different all the time. And more often than not, in a story about Luca, he himself is commenting all the time as someone else. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that make any sense? I hope that makes sense. So basically, you've got Luca, but you've also got him with fucking 15 other profiles where he's joining in the conversation about himself and the whole thing is just a big fucking it's a big mess he starts putting out all these rumours online under the name like you know he's working under another name so say he's like oh I'm Bobby Smith (laughs) why would you be Bobby Smith I don't know I'm Bobby Smith have you heard Right, so Bobby Smith will say, have you heard? Luca Magnotta has got a celebrity sex tape. Now, it's not true. It's all false. It doesn't exist. But he's putting it out there. He's trying to basically just make the name 
Luca Magnotta something that people will remember. That is a hell of a admin. That is a hell of a life admin to be getting on with all the time, isn't it? This guy. This guy. This fucking guy. Luca thinks he is so clever in this situation. He thinks he's got this sewn up. Thinks he's brilliant. But what he's forgotten is that actually when you upload a photo to Facebook or Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, do whatever you do, location services, they're tracking that all the time. So it's not hard for people to pin that down and go, that photograph was taken in such and such a location at a certain time by this type of phone. So he thinks he's being like mega smart all the time, right? He thinks he's like well above it. But what he doesn't know is this task force who are after him for the kitten videos, they're tracking him. They're watching him. They're doing their best to to zone in on where he is all the time. So police get involved because the videos of the killing of the kittens, it becomes huge. It becomes absolutely massive and police have to get involved. And they discover that he's still somewhere. They can't pinpoint exactly where, but they know that he's in Toronto somewhere. Where in Toronto is the problem? They just can't pin down where. And everything they think they've got, the kitten killer, he moves about. He changes and they just, oh, annoyingly, they just can't pin him down. So a few months pass and then two more videos appear online under the name Luca Magnota. Now, if you found the descriptions of the kitten killings hard, the first time round you're going to find these even harder, so I would maybe warn you to, if you don't want to listen to this, please don't. In one of the videos, he takes a three week old kitten and he feeds it to a python. In the second video, he ties a kitten to a pole and he drowns it in a bath of water. I know, it's just, it's just horrible. Just fucking, yeah, horrific. I mean, seriously, are you this desperate for fame? Are you so desperate that this is what you're doing? So online, the search is on for Luca. The search is on. Within the police, it's not necessarily the biggest priority, and I can I can kind of understand that. As horrific as it is, the dealing with, you know, Toronto is a major city. And there is so much crime that someone who is the kitten killer is probably quite far down the list. But that in itself brings a lot of outrage because people are like, well, why are we not stopping this? Why are we not? Because who knows where this might go? Who knows where this might escalate to? So police are on top of it. You know, they're kind of trying to be aware of it but it doesn't necessarily mean anything much is being done to look for Luca. Now, in the in the UK, there is a newspaper. It's a, it's a British institution, and it's called The Sun. The Sun newspaper has been about since fucking day dot. It's been about forever. I'll remember it from when I was very young. 
The Sun newspaper was um, <laughs> one of those newspapers that um, had the very famous page three girl. So you used to, every time you opened the newspaper, there would be a girl with her boobs out. That was what the Sun was known for. It was always the page three. And I think only recently, actually, I don't buy the Sun newspaper, but I think only recently it um, stopped doing that. So, <laughs> yes, but it was a it was a big favourite. It was a big favourite in the UK, and and still is. It's a bit. It's not a well, obviously, as you can tell, because it's boobs out. It's not a. It's not a great <laughs> newspaper, and it does like to report on a lot of strange things and a lot of celebrity things. But what the Sun newspaper did was it put the story of the crazy kitten killer who was killing kittens in Canada on its front pages and the fact that Canadian police weren't doing anything about it. It was front page news, but only for a day, and then it disappeared. However, who should arrive at the head offices of the Sun newspaper in London but... Luca Magnotta. He arrives and he announces himself as the crazy kitten killer. Now, a journalist immediately jumps to interview him and this is what he says. He says, I know I came in here and announced that I was that kitten killer but it's all lies he said I said that just to get through the doors because secretly I'm being framed by someone else this is a personal attack on my celebrity what celebrity do you think you have you whack a fucking doodle are you having a laugh you have no celebrity But he's come to this newspaper to say, I mean, how fucked is this? He's come to say, actually, it is me. But also at the same time, oh, I'm really sorry. Actually, someone else is trying to pin it on me. I don't think the newspaper journalists have a clue what to do with this guy. Because I think they're looking at him and going, there is, there's something here that's deeply psychological and we don't really know what to do with this. What they do is they phone the police and they say, right, we've got this guy, he's rocked up, he said he might be the kitten killer, we're not really sure, he's also now saying that he's being framed and that he's really apparently dead famous, but nobody knows who he is, etc, etc. Police come and UK police go, well, do you know what? This all happened in Canada. And to be fair, you arriving at a newspaper office, we can't really do anything about it. We don't really know what to do. So they let him go. I say let him go. It's not like they had him held there. He came of his own free will. But they say, sorry, not really sure what we can do in this situation. Be on your way. So look at his not happy not happy in the slightest that he's gone to a newspaper and that they haven't properly paid attention to him because what he was wanting was he was wanting something way bigger out of this he was hoping come to London and I'll get myself notoriety people will go we finally got the kitten killer. And actually, that didn't really happen. So when he leaves, he writes to the Sun newspaper and he writes this statement. Luca Magnotta is an extremely dangerous and sick psychopath. He is incapable of feeling remorse. Psychopaths can appear very charming and look beautiful, but beware. 
They are cunning and highly maniacal. All right, Luca, get over yourself, mate. And that is describing yourself as beautiful. So, meanwhile, the group of people who are trying to hunt down Luca because of those cat videos think that they might be closing in on him. Start to piece together lots of evidence that they think, well, eventually we can take this to a court. We can say, yes, we know he is the man who drowned the kitten in a bath, who put two kittens in a bag. We know that he is this man. Let's just do a little at this moment. Luca Magnotta check in. Let's just see where we are because the story is about to take its darkest turn. So far we've got stole money from a very vulnerable person. We have he is a complete narcissist. And we now have four videos in which kittens have been killed. It's not boding very well for Luca. If Luca Magnotta wants to be remembered forever, his next act is going to be the one that will never be forgotten. Luca starts to post messages online which say this time it was a kitten the next time it will be a person enter into the story a man called Jean Lin a young man from China and he had arrived in Toronto to study. So as a young man he was from a not very wealthy family in China, in fairly rural China. But he was clever, he was smart and he had gotten a scholarship and here he was decided that he was going to take a scholarship and come to Canada and come to Toronto. So Jun Lin was gay and in his life in China he hadn't really had a great deal of time to explore a lot of his sexual preferences, practices and so when he got to Toronto this was a real opportunity for him to do that. So he is in Toronto and he's living a great life. He's having a fantastic time. Jean Ling is going about his life. He's loving it, having a brilliant time. And at the same time, Luca Magnotta is sitting in his apartment creating, oh my God, this guy, creating videos of himself putting them up online which say Luca Magnotta is a psychopath. If you see him, do not approach him. This man is dangerous. So he's putting these up, right? He's putting them on Facebook. He's putting them anywhere that he can for anyone to see. Again, it's just constantly trying to, you know, get himself notoriety or try and be something that that he isn't and I wish to God I wish to God that Jean Ling had seen these videos but he didn't through an app a sex app one that's designed for gay men to hook up get together, have sex. Luca Magnota manages to convince Jean Ling, 
who hasn't been in Toronto that long, who's just exploring his own self, his own sexuality, Luca convinces him to come to his apartment. Now, during their conversation on their app, Jeanling says that what he likes is he quite likes to be tied up and to be dominated. I wish to God he had never said those words to Luca Magnotta. I wish to God he'd never said them. Luca responds and says, well, I I like to dominate. That's that's my thing. So why don't you come to my house and we'll have some fun. And I can hear you right now screaming. I can hear you all screaming, no, don't let Jean Ling go to that apartment. Because, yeah, I was screaming it internally myself. I really was. But he does. Sean Ling goes to Luca Magnotta's apartment for sex. And it is the last time that he will ever be seen alive. A week passes and nobody has seen him. Nobody has seen Sean Ling. Where has where he gone? What's happening? His classmates in university, they start to become worried because they don't know where he is. So they, they call his family in China and they say, has he been in touch? And his family say, no, we've heard nothing from him. A week and a half passes and this makes me sick to my fucking stomach. I hate this. Luca Magnotta puts up a status and it says, has anyone seen a video online? It's called One Lunatic and One Ice Pick. Now at first there's, there's not really much, there's not really much attention, but Again, using all of his different names and his different profiles, he starts, he actually manages to start a conversation about the video just because he's got all these different profiles. So he's putting out there one lunatic, one ice pick. Now, horrific. I haven't, I would never in my fucking life watch it. I would never watch it. But I did see two, just during research, I saw two stills from it and I just was like, no, I can't, I can't watch that. I can't, I, no, I would never watch it. But just, I couldn't even look at the pictures of it. It's just horrific. So the video that he puts up shows Jun Lin tied to a bed alive, ready for sex, and then the video goes black. And the next image that you see is Jun Lin dead, still tied to the bed. Then a hooded figure appears and starts to dismember the dead body. During the point of dismembering the body, the figure has sex with the dead body on the bed. At one point in the video, there's bits of dead flesh falling off of the body and the figure feeds them to a dog. Those might be some of the roughest words I have ever spoken there. Luca puts this video up because he wants a reaction. He wants the world to know 
that he has brought this guy to his house, tied him to a bed, killed him and mutilated him. That's what he wants. He wants the fucking world to know that he's done this. What does he do once he's done it? Well, he flees. He leaves the scene. But just before, just before he leaves, because obviously he can never be finished with looking for attention, because this guy can never be done with looking for fucking attention. He does just the craziest, craziest fucking thing in the world. He takes the left foot of Junling and he wraps it up in a box and he posts it to the Conservative Party of Canada. Of course he does. Fucking hell. He then takes the left hand of Junling and he posts it to the Liberal Party of Canada. I mean, these people are receiving this through the post. Are you kidding? What the fuck is he doing? He then takes the remainder of Junling's body, he puts it into a suitcase, and he leaves it in his apartment. But there is, and I beg, please don't ever watch it, there's CCTV footage online of Luca Magnotta actually taking out the other bits of the body that he just didn't know what to do with and putting them in the communal bins. You can actually see this footage online of him carrying bits of body down into the bins. <sighs> Junling's missing. A search starts. But Luca Magnotta is gone. He is out of there. First of all, he goes to Paris. He uses a fake name. Then he goes to Berlin. But again, he's using a fake name. He doesn't realise that actually authorities are quickly on to the situation and they are tracking him down. And so police find Luca Magnotta in and get this internet cafe in Berlin and when they burst in to arrest him he's actually looking at pictures of himself online but he's now arrested he's taken in he's questioned he's fingerprinted and there is no doubt there is no fucking doubt he is responsible for the death of Junling. And now the trial arrives. The trial takes 10 weeks. 10 long, long weeks. He never testifies in any of it. He pleads not guilty. But at the end of the day, a jury finds him guilty of first degree murder. He is sentenced to a hard 25 years in prison without parole. Doesn't really seem long enough to me, but okay. He also receives on top of that another 19 years for posting the video of his killing of Jean Lin and for the necrophilia. So in the end, through horrific animal cruelty, through lying, through a crazy world of online deception, through the murder, decapitation of a harmless young man, Luca Magnotta got the attention that he wanted. And so ends the story. Okay, yes, well, it's a bit of a crazy ride. Bit of a crazy one, the Luca Magnotta story. I just, yeah, it's fucking, it's nuts. 
The guy is so insane. And you know, I don't even really... I have a lot of, like... A, like with a lot of stories I'll find a lot of time and in my heart I'll like if someone's done something that's really horrific I'll always try and find the good in them and the bit of them that makes me go perhaps it was just mental health that was never dealt with and whatever see with Luca Magnotta I'm going to just be honest with you I think he is a dick through and through I do I think he's I think he's evil through and through. I'm just going to be honest and say that because I read a lot of stuff like about, you know, the kind of, he sends letters now from prison about what a wonderful time he's having in prison. And he's like, he's never, you know, he's still an arrogant fuck. He's still like, I think I'm the greatest person in the world. And that says to me, you know what? You're just a dickhead through and through. You just are, you're just a wee prick. Do you know what I mean? I would, I, and 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 please, you will know if you've listened to Extraordinary Stories podcast for a long time. I consider mental health, and I consider situation and context all the time, and I really factor that in to building my own opinions about people. But Luca Magnotta, I literally think evil through and fucking through, and what an arrogant little dickhead so <laughs> so that's been a that's been a lovely bloody cheery note for me to end this episode on but I do it just it just it just drives me fucking insane anyway <laughs> let's um let's end this here I hope it's not been a big a big bummer for you I hope it's not been too hard if you want to get in touch, you can. I'm on Facebook. Join the Facebook group. It's wonderful. It's amazing. It's a really brilliant place to be. But I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. You can get me there. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I do really appreciate that. I know there are a million and one podcasts out there. And I... I have a million and one that I'm trying to keep up with all the time. But if you are coming back all the time and listening to me <laughs> rambling in your ears, I do really appreciate it. And I mean that fucking mean that from the bottom of my heart. I do. For you to give me your time to listen, I really appreciate that. So, thank you. And until the next episode. Okay? Goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face... Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.